E gridate, 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 sai a me che me ne importa. E parlate, parlate, io fingerò di ascoltarvi per l'ennesima volta. Shortlist. Interesting, isn't it? The Shortlist School exists in the 1920s. It's still active. It's producing a lot of journals and articles and stuff which you never hear of. And which will never find a mention in Samuelson or anybody else in any of the schools that we talked about. Why? They actually show that it is possible to have a monetary system that produces full employment and price stability, but at the condition you cross the wire that the government issues the money. <laughs> taboo, taboo. Nobody talks about it. Okay? The guys are currently living in the University of Missouri of Kansas City, which is equivalent to what the Soviet system used for, I would say, Siberia. You send people there you never want to hear of again, and you make sure that they never can get a feedback to Obama or anybody else. Right? So, it is now possible, the full, full employment and no inflation. Academically, that school has not been challenged. And from what I study on it, they're right. Okay? Now, let me go a step further here. I don't agree with them for another reason, which I'll explain to you in a few minutes, which is the systemic nature. It does, what, what they really do is change the driver. Instead of Jason, they put, you know, Jack. Right? The government, instead of the private sector, the same system. To me, that's still not the solution. Now, how many of you know the difference between the Nobel Prize of Economics and the other Nobels? Anybody? Yes? What is it? It is an irregular Nobel Prize. Oh, what's irregular about it? Central Bank of Sweden, oh. which was dominated by monetarists oh. in this social democratic country. Gee! Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that is a sufficient answer. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay. Now, Paul Krigman told me personally that it was totally crazy to talk about the money issue. He said, have you not, we were both from MIT, okay, we were graduated in the same school. We had the same professors, right? And what he told me, didn't they tell you? Never touch the money system. Never touch the money system. You can touch everything else. Never touch the money system. And the reason is there. You will not be invited in the right places, and you can kiss goodbye on the Nobel on anything else. That is worthwhile getting. You're killing yourself academically if you touch the money system. And the way it's enforced is, among others, to this Nobel game. That's just one example. It's true for all the other things. Okay? And it's done very cleverly. Because the reward for economics, every talks about the Nobel Prize of Economics, it doesn't exist. It is the price of the Rix, the Rixpunk Prize for the, in honor of Alfred Nobel. And it's paid for by the central bank and is decided by the board of the central bank. So, this is literally the same thing as saying we'll put Microsoft or Bill Gates in charge of the future of computing. Right? You see the point? So you start seeing the, layer, the layers of blindness that we're creating here? Finally, The best lobbies are those that don't know where they're lobbies. Whenever you talk about money, and I've talked in the European Union with some people in the European Union, what did they tell me? Go and ask the central banks. Of course, you cannot do anything in that domain without asking the central bank. They are the reference, right? Interestingly enough, I've been at the central bank. And let me confess something which I haven't talked publicly about yet. The reason I left the central bank was a conversation that I had with the Secretary General of the, United, of the Bank of International Settlements, which is the club of the central banks, where I was a delegate of Belgium. And they told me, literally, I had written a book on Latin America back in 1979, 
announcing the Latin American debt crisis, for those who remember this old history. It was, believe it, the only book that actually announced the crisis of the, of the Latin American debt. And he said, Bernard, I read your book. What are you doing in a central bank? And I told him the truth. Interestingly enough, in the Belgian central bank, they never asked me that question. Or well, would have told them too. I said, look, I believe that I just written a book on Latin America saying that this is going to be the first of a series of monetary crashes because this is a systemic issue. Okay? And thought that the most logical place would be in a central bank. So when you offered me the job, I came. But he said, but Bernard, you have to understand. We exist, the Bank of International Settlements. The central banks exist. The IMF, the World Bank exists only for one purpose. One purpose. To keep the system going as it is. Not to improve it. It is the lobby for status quo. It was created in the 19th century because the deal that the banking system got at the time was the best they ever could get. So we now we're going to create an institutional framework that actually freezes that reality forever. Okay? So that's the last bit. There's an active lobby that nobody sees as a lobby, because it's different from the central banks, or different from the banks, right? Oh yes, that's an, you know, they actually fight with each other, and they actually you know, have disagreements about these things, but there's one thing they agree on, the status quo on the system. The car is a tabu. Okay? That's the message. Are we clear so far? So we can start seeing why we don't see. We've been trained not to see for a long time. Okay, now let's go to the systemic cause. Uh, my colleague, Robert Dulanovic from the University of Maryland, has spent 25 years quantifying um, the flow of biomass in an ecosystem. Uh, you'll ask me immediately, what the hell does that do with money, right? I'll give you the answer. What basically a, a, an ecosystem is a network, right? Yeah, the sun, give plants, animals eat the, plant, the plants, animals eat animals, we eat it all, and you know, we create an ecosystem that either is stable or not stable. And he found out that in such a network, which is a complex network, there is the systems that are stable, i.e. any ecosystem that's natural, they've been there for a few million years, otherwise they wouldn't be stable, right? You have a balance between two things, throughput efficiency and rebound capacity. Throughput efficiency is the, the quantity of stuff, biomass, that you go through in your system, and rebound capacity is the capacity to rebound, to survive, to adapt to changes in the environment or changes, diseases or whatever. Okay? Now, these are emergent properties from a network structure which is completely independent of what circulates in the network. It works for biomass in an ecosystem, it works for electrons in an electrical distribution system, it works for information in, a, in your immune system, or it works for money in a economy. They're all complex networks. You see the connection? So the structure itself is actually predetermining what is stable or not stable. Now, here is the graph. It's actually the matter well behaved. Here is you have diversity and interconnectivity, and there you have sustainability. We can now quantify for the first time with a unique metric, a single number, whether a complex system is sustainable or not. Okay? And the trade-off is between two things. If you have, uh, the optimum is there, if you go more towards less diversity, you actually can increase your efficiency, but you will reduce your sustainability. But, and if you push too far, you go beyond the optimum, you will actually have stagnation. Things kind of sit there and nothing happens. There is no dynamic, there is no movement, there is no life formation. So that is what we know. Now, in all natural ecosystems, there is a window of vitality which is pretty narrow around these two, the, around the optimum. Guess what? 
Our money system sits there, way out of the range. And the reason for it is the monopoly of one type of money.